Hi, good morning. I'm Satish Kavindaraj, Chief of Rhinology and Endoscopic Skull Base Surgery at the Mount Sinai Health System in New York. I want to thank you all for joining my live session where we will discuss COVID-19 and how we're managing sinus issues during this very difficult time. You know, the symptoms of COVID-19 is a challenge because why? They often overlap with other conditions such as the flu or seasonal allergies. But fever, fatigue, and cough are present in over 80% of patients. So that's something really to keep an eye on. If you have any of those three, then you may need to suspect that you may have COVID-19 infection. The cough that you have two thirds of the time tends to be dry. However, it can be wet or productive in the remaining one third. And shortness of breath is also a common symptom. And if it is severe, this is the reason why some people may need to go to the hospital to receive supplemental treatment such as oxygen or help breathing, and then determine whether they're bad enough where they may need to come into the hospital for additional treatment. What's interesting is that we're finding that loss or decrease in smell is really emerging as one of the more common presenting symptoms in patients with milder forms of COVID-19 infection. A recent study from our colleagues at UC San Diego demonstrated that 70% of patients who were COVID positive had an alteration in smell and taste, and it was a key distinguishing symptom. The good news, however, is that 74% of these patients did experience a return in smell and taste along with the resolution of their COVID infection. So this is very promising that we can potentially use smell moving into the future and the loss of it as a way of determining whether someone may have a milder form or early COVID-19 infection. This data is still early and more needs to be done to confirm this possibility, but it is promising. On a separate note, other less common symptoms of COVID-19, such as sore throat, headache, nausea and vomiting, and even diarrhea, are still present in patients. However, it's less common and not a distinguishing feature. The symptoms you do uh, experience tend to go on or appear within two to 14 days and after exposure. And patients may experience, experience symptoms the majority of the time within five days uh, of exposure. Now, this is an important question, especially as spring allergy season is upon us. The key symptoms that point to allergies and not COVID-19 infection are the presence of sneezing and itchiness of the eyes, ears, nose, and throat. These are not seen in COVID infection. Now, fever, fatigue, and gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, these are seen more with COVID infection or other viral illnesses such as the flu and not in patients with allergies. Also, earlier on, nasal congestion and post-nasal drip were less often seen in COVID-19 infections. We are seeing now, however, that nasal congestion, post-nasal drip can sometimes be seen in patients who had COVID-19, so they cannot be used as a distinguishing feature between allergies and COVID-19 infections. You know, the patient who has milder symptoms, consistent or suspicious for COVID-19 infections, such as fever, dry cough, fatigue, you know, they should really stay home and self-quarantine for that 14-day period. The person who should look to seek medical care is the one where their infection is worsening within that time period, or the symptoms may go beyond that 14 days, and now they're not sure what is going on. That's a person that should seek medical care. And the first step should be done through a telemedicine visit. Why? Because it allows an adequate screening visit where medical therapy can be instituted, while at the same time avoiding that patient from leaving their home and putting their cells at risk of contracting the virus by going to an urgent care center or a hospital. Also, that screening visit can help us triage, does that patient need to go to urgent care for testing? Or are they having more severe symptoms where it may be safer for them to go to their emergency room and receive additional care? The telemedicine or telehealth visits, as they're sometimes called, are video visits very similar to a FaceTime call. And once a, a patient makes an appointment that's a telehealth visit, they're sent an email where we go over the steps with them on how to register and sign in for their visit. And on the day of their visit, about 15 minutes before that time, our office will call them and guide them through the process. Once the patient logs on, the physician is notified, and then we log in and the visit begins. 
We can perform a visual exam where we can check the person's mouth, inspect the facial area, but unfortunately we can't look inside the nose or the ears and some of those areas in the same detail we can in the office setting. But luckily acute sinus infections, allergies, those are really diagnoses that are made almost completely by history. So a telehealth visit can be useful. And also the majority of sinus infections can be managed without antibiotics. And in that chronic case, the person who has recurrent issues that we've managed over the years, we more or less know which treatment measures work for them and we can implement them in a telehealth fashion. The other advantage is with telehealth, we can really review imaging with patients. Many of the radiology centers allow us to upload their images to our medical record. And in real time, we can review imaging with the patient, both the CT scan and the MRI. Uh, and it's very easy to do so. You know, this is a great question also in light of the fact that we are in allergy time. And many times patients do develop sinus infections during this time period. But the key differences between sinusitis and allergies is that sinus infections have yellow or colored drainage from the nose and also can have fever. Those are the two key distinguishing features between the two. The other thing to think about is seasonal allergies often present with itchiness, either of the eyes, ears, nose, and throat. So this is something we see more often in allergies and not in a sinus infection. Now the problem occurs since we are in allergy season, sometimes patients have bad allergies and they can develop sinus infections. And this is the case where we may want to see someone in the office with a telehealth visit to determine what type of treatment should we give them. Do, do they need antibiotics? Do we need to increase their allergy regimen? These are things that are very important. Why? Because patients with allergies many times often have asthma. And we want to avoid any triggers to their asthma that may require the use of systemic steroids. Systemic steroids are something that can bring down the immune system. And this is something we want to avoid at a time period where we're dealing with a pandemic and a virus that we don't know very much about. We really are able to evaluate and at least initiate medical treatment in the majority of rhinology conditions through a telemedicine visit. Rhinitis is essentially inflammation in the nose, and it can be allergic or non-allergic. And luckily, the treatments for rhinitis tend to be medical and can be initiated with a good history and visually seeing the patient. For acute sinus infections, it also helps us to do a telehealth visit. Why? Because just by seeing the patient, we can determine if any of those issues or that infection is spreading outside the sinuses to surrounding areas. The eyes, for example, are a great way to be seen on a telehealth visit. And if we have a bad infection that's spreading to the eye, well, we can see that during that time period. You know, this is a way for someone who lives outside the city to have an initial evaluation and determine if they should be seen in person in one of those subsequent visits. You know, this is a very important question, one we need to come to a sound answer to. The reason why is that COVID-19 infections are not the only medical issues that we're dealing with. And patients with CSF leaks, inverted papilloma, which is a benign tumor that affects the nose and sinuses, but has a chance of turning into cancer, these are important conditions and we need to find a way to treat them. And you know, in the case of a CSF leak, if a patient has no history of meningitis, has been leaking for weeks to months, and we have imaging that we review that shows no areas of concern, then we do feel it may be safer to wait at this point until we have a better hold on the COVID outbreak. With telehealth, we can really keep a close eye on this patient. They can, they can communicate with us to make sure that if anything worsens, then we can arrange to have that person seen in the office and potentially schedule surgery. In the case of inverted papilloma or other benign or malignant tumors, it's important for us to see and review that pathology to make sure the diagnosis is correct. We need to review the images also. This is very important, why? Because we need to see is there involvement of critical structures such as the eye or the base of the brain where we would not want to delay that treatment for too long. So, a combination of clinical judgment, the telehealth visit where we review the imaging, as well as the chart of the patient to determine how acute or chronic these issues are, all that goes into play when we're deciding how to manage these patients uh, in an urgent session. 
setting. This is a very important thing to consider as the uh, pandemic starts to come down. How are we going to transition into the office setting? And the first thing I'll say is we can assure patients that when we open our doors to see them, it will be in the safest way possible. We plan on incorporating virtual check-ins and limiting physician schedules to avoid any unnecessary overcrowding in the office. Patients will be given masks and gloves when they arrive to protect them as well as the staff. And in the ideal setting, if rapid testing is available, a three-point testing uh, will be performed where we, perf where we do uh, rapid COVID testing or at least pre-test patients prior to arrival in the office, temperature check and pulse ox, which is essentially checking oxygen levels on the patient. Hopefully the combination of those three being negative allows us to bring a patient into the office and feel they are COVID negative. Uh, physicians and staff will wear protective gear and equipment, not only to protect themselves, but also our patients. And then lastly, similar to an operating room, we plan on thoroughly cleaning our rooms between visits in order to ensure there's no risk of transmission from patient to patient. So I do think it's an effective means of communicating with our patients and they walk away with the experience, I have to say thus far, very satisfied. I would honestly say that the majority of us, this was kind of forced onto us. And I do feel that moving into the future, most of us will incorporate telemedicine into our daily practice in some way or form. You know, as far as the best way to reach us, uh, patients as well as referring physicians can either go to our website, which is www.mountsinai.org forward slash sinuses, or they can call our office at 212-241-9410. You know, I really feel that our staff and our physicians are committed to the care of our patients. And, you know, I want to wish everyone out there to, uh, uh, great health, stay home, stay safe, stay healthy. And I honestly believe that we'll emerge from this experience with hopefully a greater appreciation for friends, family, and most of all, our patients. So I wish you all well, take care, and stay safe.